I'm Andy Gill. I'm going to do a talk about something. I uh, haven't just written the slides, honestly. Um, they've been written for about 10 minutes, so we'll get there. It'll be fine. So uh, if you read the brief, you might have thought the talk was about pen testing and learning about shit and winging it and stuff like that. And you might be sort of right. It's sort of about winging it and sort of about pen testing. But anyway, so uh, the obligatory who am I? Uh, I'm Zephyr Fish, or Andy Gill. You might know me for several reasons. Uh, I won't shut up about a book I wrote, and some people seem to enjoy it. If you've not read it, go fucking buy it, it's great. Um, I, you also might know me because I go to a lot of security conferences and I talk at people, but not actually do talks. So this is the first time in about three years I've done a talk at a security conference, so it, maybe, maybe it'll go okay. Uh, uh, FC and Jessica Barker were chatting about it at the start, what's the worst that could happen on stage? And I went, well, probably shit yourself. Hopefully that doesn't happen, so we'll go for it. And the other reason you might know me, um, I found a couple of years ago, I found quite a few bugs in quite well-known public services website. Some of you might have heard of it. They serve videos for people. Um, if you don't know, go and Google my name, you'll, you'll find out. This is a safe for work talk, guys. Um, I also work, so my day job, I work, for a pen, uh, I work for a company called Pentest Partners as a security consultant, so I break shit for a living, um, and I get paid for it, which is quite good fun. Um, in my evenings, I spend them kicking things, breaking things, hacking things, going to films, and driving places. Sometimes in that order, because it's quite good fun. Fuck, there's a lot of people. <laughs> Get a seat, guys. Come on, I've only just started. I've not even got into the interesting stuff yet. Just talking about myself. So that's me there. Not dead. Although some of you might have been led to believe last night on Twitter I was dead. That's red wine. I saw an opportunity and I took it. That's what you should do in pen testing, always. So apart from being a techie and all that shit, I'm also a black belt in karate, so I'm not only a keyboard warrior, I can break your legs if I want to. <laughs> so there's that. So, plan for today. Yes, we're going to understand pen testing. I'm going to give you a few tips and tricks on what I've learned throughout my time in pen testing, which is about four years. Some lessons that I wish I'd been taught before I got into pen testing. Um, the different trades that a tester can have, so it's not all about hacking, there are other aspects of things. And also a bit of businessy stuff as a pen tester slash hacker, because it's not all popping shells, it's not all sunshine and rainbows, as they like to say, but it's, it's good fun. So, I've got a giggle. Penetration testing. If you've not heard it before, it's the art of finding holes on certain websites. Or in the real world, it's, it's hacking things. But it's, it's a good conversation starter. Certainly when you're chatting to a bunch of muggles who have no idea what you're talking about. They ask you what you're doing, you go, well, I'm a penetration tester. And they're like, right, what's that? It's like, well, uh, it's not what you think. Find holes in computers and break things and do bits and pieces. But it's also a good laugh when you follow up with, I find holes in Pornhub. And they go, there's a lot of holes in that website. <laughs> Don't you know it? So, so really, what is pen testing? The expectation, as I've already said, is popping shells all day, hacking all the things. And yes, there is quite a lot of that. But the reality is, you're working as a consultant for a client, so you're, you're, there's a massive human aspect of things. Once you break something, you need to explain to the client, well, yes, I broke your thing, but this is how you fix it, and this is why it's a, why it's a problem. Recently on site, I was with a client, and they had uh, MS-08, which is quite a known uh, vulnerability. If you don't know, it's, it's probably one of the most famous remote code execution vulnerabilities. And I was like, yep, this is a problem. They went, no, 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 it's fine. They're not internet connected machines. I'm like, yes, but your staff can still exploit these things and steal sensitive data. And they're like, nah, that'll never happen. And like a month later, somebody ran off with their customer database. So I'm like, I didn't just tell you this like a month ago. It's, it's fine. So that's, that's what happens in pen testing. You tell people that their stuff's broken and you try to help them and they don't listen to you. So what are you going to do? Anyway, you also need to be the king or queen of analogies when you're explaining things to the business because you can't just go, well, I found XSS, CSRF, SSRF, and all that stuff, and the business guy goes, what? Like, yeah. So anyway, I'm rattling through this talk and I've only been speaking for two minutes. Anyway, so tricks of the trade. Uh, the good, the bad, the downright ugly. The two. So these are the do's of, of pen testing. When you're, when you're approaching a web app, read the fucking manual, always. If you, have to, if you have time, because sometimes if you can pwn the framework, the app will fall. It's always worth doing. So if you've got something like Oracle Business Suite, you look at it and you go, oh, well, some guy called Dave Litchfield found a bunch of vulnerabilities. You go and use them straight away. You've got RCE or you've got XSS or you've got SQL injection or something else. So they're quick wins or looking at little bits and pieces that might fall under <laughs> stress in certain environments. You've also got to be not afraid of Googling things like a ninja. You just, if, 
in, in pen testing, it's inevitable. You're going to come across something on site, or you're going to come across something an application you've never seen before. You might have seen something like it, but you know how to. Well, maybe you don't know how to do it. Be asking Google, "How do I do this?" Now, a lot of people will say, oh, "I don't do that." It's like but you do. You do. You, you think about it. You go, "Well." I've seen XSS before, but I've not seen it in this, this environment. XSS, for those who don't know, is cross-site scripting, so it's a way of executing JavaScript in a victim's browser. So you, you might see that one tag is filtered out, you might try something else, and Googling it finds, you find a lot of stuff in Google. It's good. So as well as that, on an application, actually use it before you go start hacking stuff, because sometimes functionality can also be a bug. You have the common phrase that it's not a bug, it's a feature. But a lot of the time, that stuff can lead to more serious issues. So actually use it before you go breaking it. The other aspect of that is if you start hacking things before you actually use it, and it, you break it to an extent that it's no longer usable, how are you going to like work out what the risk is to the business? Because you're like, oh yeah, I got XSS. The app doesn't work anymore. And they're like, well, yeah, that's great. But like, can you elaborate on why it's a problem or, or how what uses that impacts? Because if you go and break an app, can't use it, you're doing a five-day test, you burn day one, you're screwed, basically. Um, the other tips I have are... Uh, if you can't use Google, if you're on site, always ask a colleague. You'll be surprised how much people know more than you and the little things you forget, you can use them and it's really, really useful. Also, being on site on your own can be quite lonely, so maybe don't ask the client how this works or maybe do, it just depends who you're with. Always gauge your situation on what you're doing. Um, so Google like a ninja. Um, when it comes to infrastructure, try HTTP and HTTPS on kind of random ports. You'd be surprised what's running on HTTP. I found things running on like port 10,000 or 11,001 that is an admin interface for like a backend database on the internet. And people are like, no one ever find that. It's on a high port. No one scans high ports. It's true. Some people don't, but the people who do, you find the, the golden tre treasure trolls. So it's, it's worth doing. There are the other random things where you find really high ports. So always do a port, full port scan if you can, because you can find things running. You can run Netcat, connect to it, find an admin interface, use FTP, use Telnet, things that are very old, but are still vulnerabilities, and people still run Telnet on port 10,000 because it'll be fine, it's safe. So pe people like devs and admins, they do weird things. So that's the do's of uh, pen testing, the don'ts. Don't do these things, bad things happen, okay? So when you're, when you're testing a web app, and this, I know someone who's done this, don't run Spider, just, don't just click Spider and go around and go for lunch. There's really bad things happen. I had a mate of mine in the previous company who ran Spider on a WordPress site, and uh, it came across, he had automatically submit forms on, so when it finds a function, it would just automatically click on it. And it had a function that was delete tables. Now, that's fine. Oh, sorry, drop tables. So what's in the picture? Drop tables. That's fine if you catch it, but he wiped the entire client production database, dev database, and pre-prod database in the space of a lunch hour. And I was like, so how are you doing? He's like, yeah, it's a great test. Haven't found anything. The app's down. I'm like, okay, why is the app down? So he calls the client and goes, so the app's down. And they're like, yeah. Everything's down. It's like, okay, uh, care to elaborate? There's no data. Where's the data gone? So they go through the logs. And it's like, oh yeah, we found a function that's dropped tables and you can do it unauthenticated. Who thought that was a good idea? So anyway, don't spider things randomly. Also, if you're using Burp Suite, don't just right click on the root of the web, web root and click active scan because that can also cause problems. I was on site recently and there was a web interface for virtual desktop environments that had a shutdown function, which is fine for admins because you obviously need to shut down maybe boxes on the estate. You think maybe there's uh, authentication or something, but but no, who needs authentication? We're on an internal network. So uh, if, you, if you were to active, actively scan that, we didn't do it, but we, we asked the client afterwards if we could, it would just shut down random boxes. It would just pick a box and go, we're going to shut that one down, that one down, and that one down. Because why not? It was, it was test disaster recovery, but I don't know who thought that was a good idea. But alas, always make sure as well. See, when you're given a target range by a client to scan, check it's the right range. Because <coughs> if, you're, if you're internally or externally, the worst thing that can happen is the client goes, yep, so my external range is 192.168.2.1. You're like, is it, is it really... <laughs> and, and where am I going to be located? Are you going to give me a VPN? Oh, no, you don't need a VPN. We can access it fine in our systems. It's like, yeah, you, that was fine. We'll, we'll deal with it later. The other problem is, you, you, as, as a human, you will make, you will sometimes mistype things. So always be careful what you're typing into the web browser. If you mistype a domain by a single character, stuff can go wrong. 
hasn't happened to me personally, but one of my colleagues, uh, not current company, or two companies ago, entered a URL long, was hacking it for five days, so no problem, delivers a report, client goes, uh, yeah, that's not a wrap. Don't know whose app that is, but it's not a wrap. So don't be that guy. <laughs> So as well, the other don'ts is always be careful what kind of bandwidth you've got. Um, not work-wise, but in my personal, um, I do like research, I do personal research, and I have a 10 gig um, dedicated server, so it's got a 10 gig line. And normally, yeah, that's fine, it's great for torrenting and everything else, but see when you go to test applications, just be careful you're not dosing someone with 10 gigs of data when you do a port scan. It happens, I've seen it. I was doing a, a bit of research and, and the site went down, I was like, oh shit, the site's down. What did I do? And I went and did it from my like lesser VPS and nothing was happening. I said, oh, it's the bandwidth. You need to be careful how much data you're sending. So always worth looking into and, and being careful. So they're, they're the, the do's and don'ts of, of testing. So the lessons I thought I'd maybe want to teach you as a potential pen tester. On site 101, always pack everything. Be prepared for anything. If you're working in a data center, pack warm clothes. If you're working in a data center, pack cold clothes. Have a long ethernet cable, have a switch, have an extension lead. Basically go in like you're ready for war. Have a camping chair because the floor is comfortable for a day, but if you're on site for five days, it's not fun. Believe me, I've done it. Have a USB ethernet adapter, multiples of them, because one can fail. You can be convinced the night before it was working. Rock up on the client site, it's like, yep, go to the client, it's definitely your fault, your infrastructure's broken. Find out your ethernet adapter, it's died. Always have multiples. Always have a USB stick on you if, uh, if you need to transfer things to the client, but make sure it's encrypted. Don't want to pass the client data about, because that would be silly. Also be prepared for things not to work. Anyone who's been on site as a pen tester or as an IR consultant or anything, day one normally is a write-off. Normally, sometimes the client rocks up and goes, so yeah, um, we knew you were coming. We've known this for three months, but we're not ready. It's like, okay, cool, that's fine. We'll just we'll wait for you. And you, you get to lunchtime, they're like, have you got credentials yet? Nah, we're still waiting on credentials. We need to put a change order in and get all that stuff sorted out. Which, it happens. Anyone who's a pen test in the room will have experienced it at some point. If you haven't, you've got fantastic clients and I feel really bad for you that you're missing a day on site, alas. Anyway, so, this talk, winging it. Most folks are winging it. And if they tell you they're not, they're lying or they're probably old and have been in the business for a while and know everything up here. But not winging it in the sense that I have no idea what I'm doing. It's more that every opportunity is a learning opportunity. I had a colleague of mine describe it as experimenting. So you're not necessarily learning a new technology and then going, I'm just going to hack it. You're, you're learning a new technology, experimenting it, and then trying it on client site. And, and usually it ends up being pretty well. Because you can find technology one week that you've never dealt with before, but you've found something similar to it. And you can apply the same methodology, the same motions to that to go and hack this something completely unknown. So it's, it's really good from that perspective. And it works 50% of the time, most of the time. So there's that. The other hats of a tester. So a tester can have many hats, not in this case of black hat, white hat, and gray hat, because we've all heard of that, the good guys, the bad guys, and the guys that are not quite sure if they're good, bad, or ugly. But alas, you have the, the, the range of trades that you deal with as a tester on a day-to-day -day basis. You're a hacker, yes, you're finding holes, you're finding problems. You're a consultant, so you're helping the business fix things. You're also helping the blue team in some aspects of things. So if you break something, you're working with the recovery, the incident response, the forensics, everything. You're, you're learning on the go. Uh, this, is, this is a quote that's not really related to the, the slide, but I found it quite funny anyway. One of my colleagues, uh, this, this is his mantra for testing, something, something, root. So you rock up, you go, done this, 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 root, nailed it. No bother. So it's, it seems to be working for him. So yeah, you've got, you've got the different trades. The, the trades that being a hacker, you don't really get taught in university, you don't really get taught in courses, it's the business aspect of things. So, so being a better business hacker, you get all these amazing acronyms and you've got, you've got RCE, XSS, CSRF, SSRF, Beast, Poodle, Robot, SSL. You've got buzzword bingo everywhere. Co use, of, use of Comic Sans, very good there if anyone noticed. And being, being in a, a boardroom and, and seeing this, or if, if you're in a boardroom, you end up seeing this as an executive, you've got a lot of people that will just go completely blank and will just not understand what you're saying. So you need to be king at what you're going to, king or queen at what you're going to say, you need to be able to articulate to both the technical wizards and the C-level executives. I had a, um, my old boss used to say, imagine you're teaching your granny. Imagine in your executive summer, you're explaining it to an old person. Now, what the phrase used to be is imagine you're teaching a toddler, but a lot of toddlers these days are smarter than C-level execs. So <laughs> you've, got, you've got that. 
I'm thankful you guys laughed. I was like, shit, is that going to make people laugh or not? But yeah, so you've, you've got that. You, imagine you're teaching your granny any any time. So any any pen test room, any time you're doing a business risk summary uh, or executive summary, imagine you're teaching your granny. Imagine you're explaining it bit by bit. So your granny doesn't know what SSS is. They don't know what SSRF is. They don't know what SSL is. Or they might know what SSL is. They've seen it to be padlock or as some people describe the handbag in my browser. It's, it's, it's not that. So... You, it's just for shopping, yeah, it's, it's, it's fair. So you, you, need to be, you need to be able to articulate what these things are. So try and break them down. So if you're looking at something like SSL, you're like, well, there's encryption and it's keeping your data safe and it's making sure that bad guys can't see that you're on Amazon buying your shopping or bad guys can't see what you're browsing on YouTube and stuff like that. Or you've got things like XSS, so a, a, a bad guy or a good guy or, it, or a bad girl, it doesn't need no gender exclusive, all that stuff, um, can execute malicious code in your browser and therefore steal your session and steal your shopping, potentially. So think, thinking about it. As well as being a business hacker, you also need to be a people person. So being a hacker, you're quite an, well, a lot of hackers are introverts. I'm quite a social guy, so I find myself quite a people person, but you need to be able to manage your situation. So it's a case of managing the clients. So when things go wrong, you need to be able to communicate that to the client. You need to be able to articulate things in a way that you then become a consultant more than a hacker. So you're, you're able to manage when things are happening. So if, if you report something to a client, so I had one of my colleagues say to me yesterday, they called the client and they went, well, yeah, something's gone wrong. And but they didn't follow up with an email. So the client at the end of the day went, oh, no, that wasn't reported to us. We didn't hear anything. I said, but, but I told you on the phone. I said, oh, no, but there's nothing on paper. So always always keep a note of everything. Always always try and, try, try and keep notes. It's, it's the same as anyone who's looked at the forensic process. You keep everything in a repeatable state. Your report is going to be repeatable by someone. So anything that goes into your report should be like communicated with you and the client and also anything you say should be in your report and vice versa. So there, there's that. I have rattled through this talk in about 15 minutes. I do apologize, but you can find me on the internet. Uh, that's my Twitter, my blog, my book, which is currently free. So anyone who's interested in getting into pen testing and security, uh, check out my book. It's, it's pretty good. Um, also, the company I work for, Pentest Partners, we do blogs about hacking IoT things and lots of bits and pieces. You might have heard of us. It's pr pretty good stuff. So I'll give, give you a minute to, to take a few pictures of that or come and find me afterwards. And finally, does anyone get any questions? You got questions? Well, yeah, all right, okay, is it 10 minutes, anyone get any questions? Because I don't want to be the guy waiting about afterwards that, that yeah. Do you find that um, minimal work in pen testing goes towards just compliance and ticking the box, or do you actually have clients who are really busy but really, for some of the tools I've been working with from professional pen testers and a lot of the industry, is like, no, I just need to explore that compliance or access and tick. So, the question was, is pen testing going to more towards compliance? Yes and no. You get clients who do want tick box exercise, but a lot of clients that I work with and that pen test partners work with are wanting actual pen testing. So they want their apps tested for to be secure or to be to an acceptable risk standard. You've got the same things with hardware. You're wanting newer hardware to be to find holes before the bad guys do. There are a, there is a certain degree of things like cyber essentials which are checkbox exercises, but it means that you get a, a badge that you can go and work with Ministry of Defence, which is fair enough if you're if you're Jimmy's corner shop or J Jimmy's IT that wants to go and work with the MOD or do something. You need to be cyber essentials certified, so therefore that is a tick box exercise. But I would say the majority of pen testing is probably seventy thirty um, between seventy percent being actual pen testing, thirty percent being tick box exercise. The other problem you have is things like GDPR. Mm -hmm which people want pen testing because like, oh shit, GDPR is coming in. We need pen tested. We need to find our holes and all this other stuff. But I'd say it's probably 70, 30. There are some firms out there that are they're described as probably pen test puppy mills. So they'll go out and just do a check what it says over and over and over again because it's an easy grand day, easy, 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 which is fine like because you're making a lot of money. But if you're a pen tester in that environment, you'd be expect you, you'd be expecting yourself to move on within 12 months to go and find something more interesting. So does that answer your question or something? Yeah. Anyone else? Yep. Is there any trends coming up that you find yourself being more and more sensitive to the type that you get? Uh, so trends wise, certainly pen test partners, we've we do quite a lot of work with hardware, so we've got quite a lot of internet enabled internet of things uh, tests that come up. We've got a lot of um, like vehicle hacking and bits and pieces. Uh, the kind of trend is more towards hardware nowadays. Uh, there's a lot of people being interested in like phishing and different 
and fishing has always been quite interesting, but the, the, the team, it's now becoming more and more interesting because people are going, oh, GDPR, we need to do everything, which is just a bunch of letters, really. But the, the trend is more towards hardware, or we find it more towards hardware now, but there's still a lot of web anyway. Other other places will probably find that a lot of stuff is moving towards web because everyone everyone and their dog can write a, a dev app and go, I've got AngularJS, I've got this, I've got that. that. That's, that tends to be the, the kind of trend in that aspect of things, but I'd say probably hardware. So if you're wanting to you know, get into pen testing hardware, the, the, I'd, I'd probably say it's the, the way forward. Go and listen to my colleague, Andrew Tierney's talk. He's going to be talking about that sort of stuff uh, later on. So it's worth, worth going to. Yeah. Anyone else? So if you destroy everything because it appeared one way, how do you know when to look and when to just say, well, it seems similar, so I'll just go ahead with it? So when I said transfer methodology, it's not like by the book going, well, I found the exercise here, so I'm going to try it here. It's more looking at the technology. So if you find, if you come across an application, for example, that uses WebSockets, so I, I came across one recently that uses WebSockets, and it's using everything that's transparent. So you look at similar techniques you used in applications previously. So I found um, previously that this application has object referencing, so it references by one, two, three, and if you iterate through, iterate through them, you can download the documents. So the same thing is applicable that way. It's not just kind of going, yes, I found this, this is directly transferable to this. It's, it's taking it and being more fluid with it. So not, not, not like for like, but knowing when to Google things is more like, you've heard of it, you sort of understand it, go and read about the kind of documents, that sort of thing. So that's, that's what I would say to be applicable. Also, Google's really helpful for when there's random flags on tools. So if you're using like a really old like Oracle SQL and you've, you've not used it in ages, or maybe you've never used it and you're like, shit, don't know the flags for this, it's, it can be really useful to go look up the man page. Man page is really useful. So it's worth, worth doing. That, that helped. Anyone else? Yep. How much of your time do you find that these like pen testing and vulnerability research become, like, do you spend as much or less as an amount of time doing vulnerability research? It depends on the job. It depends on the technology as well. So some applications will be brand new technology that you've maybe never seen before and, and you end up finding bugs by accident that end up going, well, I found SQL injection here and it's blind, but it's quite, or maybe it's not blind, it's timed. So you'd only get in the app sleeping for like one, two, three seconds at a time. You want to dig into it and find more. So it really depends on the, the length of the job. If you've got a, a two plus one, so two days test and one day report, and you're not going to have enough time to write an OD. Or if you if you do, you're not, you know, elite, elite hacker. But it just varies. Some, sometimes you'll get like a 20 day test, which is fantastic because you've got enough time to look at like a whole framework or something and go and dig really deep. But it just depends. But also the, the, the kind of personal aspects of things I do, like bug bounties and stuff, my free time. And I find myself doing a lot of research with that, which helps with my day job. So I'll find something in a bug bounty, which earns me a bit of cash or whatever. But then I see it in a, in a customer job a couple of weeks later and go, oh, I've seen that before. I can go and apply that. So it's it, it, it's sort of variable. It depends on, it depends on the length of the job, depends on how interesting it is, depends on the technology, if you've seen it before, there's, there's lots of factors. But I realise it's a really vague answer. But yeah. Yep. AI is taking over the world, we know it. It's all going to our jobs all want to robots at some point. How long before pen testing is becoming automated? Do you think there's one that's too bottled up? That's my range. Just let you go. Just go on. I don't think that. To be honest, Stuart, I don't think that'll ever happen. I think the human aspect of things is always going to be valuable because you'll get clients. I mean, th there are already automated solutions out there. There's automated AV that is meant to be next generation amazing, but th it can still be bypassed. The computer is only as smart as the person who created it. I mean, you have artificial intelligence, which is learning and all that other nonsense, but you still ha you still need to have a human aspect of things because computers make mistakes as do humans, but. If, if you take everything by the book from AI and go, oh, this said that we're, we're vulnerable to this, it ends up being a false positive. It might be able to correct itself, but if you don't have a human to step in and go, that's actually a false positive, you'll take that as gospel and it'll be what it is. But to answer your question, how long I think it'll be, I don't think it'll ever be a time where pen testing will be replaced. I think that pen testing will evolve over time and maybe incorporate AI, but I don't think it'll be 100% replaced. The only aspect is we've seen a lot more tools coming out which are ones that you go. Well, there's, there's uh, been... I'm going to say it's actually starting to dumb down some pen tests. Uh, I mean, I know you have a few testers, so I know that some of the, the problems we've got there are smaller. Uh, pen tests, but you don't have, you can't hire expertise, so they're using them for solutions. 
yeah. and probably get a pen test. Well, that that's that is a problem. I mean, that that falls into the, the checkbox exercise that Jack was talking about over there. A lot of checkbox tests, people will just click and run nesses. Or th there are some consultancies out there. I'm not going to name them, but they will send a graduate in. They'll drop nesses in an internal network. Just run it. Out, export the nesses report and go. There's your report. There's no value there. The tester isn't learning anything. The client's not getting anything. They can they can download, pay for Nessus, it's no problem. Using Nessus as an example, there are many tools out there that do it, but Nessus is one of the most popular. So there's no value to that aspect of things, but the client's like, oh, I've got my checkbox, I'm happy. So it's just, it's it's up to kind of personal opinion, but I'd, I'd say from a technical aspect of things, nobody's nobody's getting any value out of that. You're getting a, you're getting a gold star, but the gold star means fuck all. So. I said I wasn't going to swear. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyone else? Thanks for coming along. Uh, it's my first talk in three years at a security conference. I'll spe be speaking at B-Size Glasgow about the internet of death. So if anyone fancies seeing that, come up to Glasgow. It's not far on the train. It's only four, four hours from here. It's going to be a great conference. And it'll be a great conference being run by this man. So, yeah. Thanks, guys.